the New York Film Academy's Twitch channel, School. Uh, tonight we have a couple of very special guests, and it's a very tiny room, so you can already see them. But we're going to do that awkward thing where we pretend they aren't here, and then we introduce them anyway. Um, they are a dynamic writing duo. They have worked, uh, they have written uh, numerous comics, and they've also written for television, film, uh, video games. Some of their TV shows that they've worked on is HBO's Arliss. They've worked on Kim Possible. Uh, they have, as far as comics go, they've written across pretty much all the genres. They have titles under their belt, including um, Skinwalker. They have the Amy Devlin Mysteries play ball, as well as a collaboration with Rashida Jones to create a miniseries, Frenemy of the State, for Ani Press. Our writing duo has also worked on numerous projects, well-known superhero comics, including New Mutants, New X-Men, Adventures of Superman, Checkmate, and Batman Confidential. Now, they are working on the upcoming miniseries, Dragon Age Knight Errant, for Dark Horse Comics, which is a tie-in for the award-winning fantasy game series, Dragon Age, by Bioware. And those are just a few of the things that they've worked on. And so now, to learn a little bit more about our mystery guests, <laughs> please welcome Nuenzo de Filippis. Did I get it? No. No! Sorry. Okay, we'll can move I, on. I get to try, I get to try, I get to try, I get to try, I get to try. Nunzio de Filippis. That is exactly right. Woo! Point for Gina. I'm Christina Weir! We got that one. Got Yay! That one. I knew that one from the start. Oh, thank you thank for you. having us. Yes, um, so right before we came on air, we were talking about how sad it is that Marvel circulation has apparently plummeted uh, as far as their comics, and then our producer said, or no, actually it was you. That's correct. You, you, uh, Nunzio made the comment that maybe you shouldn't make Captain America a Nazi. Um, hence, hence our introduction. <laughs> and I, yeah, nice. I have to agree. I have to agree. Um, okay, so let's let's get to, let's get to know everybody. Um, so you guys, obviously, you're married. Yes, you're, you're married. a dynamic yes. duo who actually can work together. And yeah, God, it's, it's a miracle. Hashtag relationship goals. Yeah, well, I don't know that it's a relationship goal because you know where other couples will fight about other things like toilet <laughs> seats and in-laws. We only fight about writing. And those are the those are some most really uh, brutal. Uh, oh my god! That's, that's yeah. a plus and minus right there. <laughs> yeah. was a little... um, okay, so let's talk about about you guys. Like, how did you? How did you? Well, I, okay, so I stalked you on on Wikipedia. My bad. <laughs> um, you guys met at Vassar. That's correct. Yeah. Yes, we did. How did you guys get into comic book writing? Well, I read comics my whole life um, since I was a little kid. She did. Not. I did not. <laughs> um, so I wanted to write comics, but I didn't necessarily know how. Um, we at Vassar with us was a friend named Greg Rocca, who's a bigger name in comics than we are, and he got into comics and told us that that was a place to go. So I, yeah. at first it was me, and he pulled me into a um, Detective Comics uh, issue of a Batman event mm -hmm. called Officer Down, where Jim Gordon was shot. Mm -hmm. um, so I did an issue of that, and we started writing together as a team on film and TV, and our next feature screenplay we told Greg about it and he said this would make a really good comic book. So we pitched it as a comic miniseries to Oni Press and that was Kim Walker. Oh, cool. And then her education in comics. Actually, it began a little bit before. It began earlier because I was trying to be a good friend to Greg and so when his first comic book was published, I said, I will read this. I don't know what I'm doing with it, but I will sit here and read this. And it was really good. And then I made the mistake of saying to him, I was like, this is really good. He's like, let me show you my comic book collection and like all the, the ones that weren't still at home with my parents. <laughs> how, long, how long had you guys been together before the full nerd came out? Like, when oh, she knew point? the nerd, but I don't know that I tried to force it on her until that point when I was like read this that's when the, the app that was all like the 80s Justice League comics I still oh, got yeah. like Blue Beetle oh, Booster wow. Gold like I got Booster Gold is a very special place in my heart <laughs> Aww, that's and awesome. we were we were this close to writing on Booster Gold and he had his, his own series for a while the writer was leaving we were we pitched we had a run ready to go and then Dan Jurgens was like I'd like to have my creation back and you can't really argue with that yeah, so, yeah. Dang. You only cried for a few days. Yes. It, was just, it was just like my second worst heartbreak in my life. Um, okay, so what, what, I guess you guys started then, both of you, in film and television? Yes. yes. And then you just kind of started by chance working into comics. And now what would you say you primarily work on most like comics or is it still film TV? We go back and forth, but I think we're in a place where when we come up with an idea, it naturally goes comic for us first, and then we figure out, is that not the right place for it? Maybe it should be a TV pilot script. Maybe it should be a novel we just written our 
First, second novel, our first novel, nothing happened with. Mm. Our really? second novel, we're hoping something happens with. <laughs> well, <laughs> us too. One, one of my coolest sort of just like fangirl mm. moments, uh, we were both huge fans of the show Castle, when uh. we the villain and everything, and apparently Molly Quinn was asked if she were to play a superhero who she'd want to play, and she said Mercury. And it was like, oh, it's amazing. So oh we tweeted God. to her like, that is the most amazing thing. And she's like, no, you guys are amazing. And we're like, oh, stop. <laughs> You're like, I'm, I'm just <laughs> deleting my social media. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, stop yeah. that, no, please. <laughs> this is it. Uh, that's... So, Cecily did did survive. Oh, did she? She yeah. did survive. Oh, excellent. We, when we were on New Mutants and then going into New X-Men Academy X, we created something like uh, 70 students for the school, of which about 40 were real characters. Some were just kind of background images. Yeah. Um, and then right after we left the book, they took all the powers away from a whole bunch of mutants because Scarlet Witch said, no more mutants. And so that was it. And the new writers, the editor on the book told us, because we asked when we, were, when we were leaving the book, are they going to kill any of our kids? And <laughs> the editor said, just just one or two and gave us the names. And we we're like, damn, we're going to miss those kids. You know, I love those kids. Why, why, why are those kids gone? Then we read the book. <laughs> um, they put 38 of the kids on a bus and blew it up. <laughs> so in one page, 38 kids died. I mean, it's horrible. <laughs> it, it, it is what it is. It's, what it, about it, the new writers 32? have to have a, just just because we talked about it before, and I know the whole process. <laughs> I'm not a sadist or anything. I'm like laughing at kids being blown up on a bus. <laughs> But it's like, it's, I, I, understand. It's comic I feel books. your pain. It, Look, it, it, it is you, the <laughs> nature of work for hire. You go in there for a little while, try and put your mark on the universe, have fun playing with the toys. And we had a friend who wrote on Wonder Woman, and then the next writer undid everything he did on Wonder Woman. And he was, you, know, you want to see your work be part. Like, that's, when you write on these superheroes, you don't own anything. You're, you're adding to mythology. Yeah, you want to be part of the canon. So... The worst thing that can happen is if you put something in there and you think this is perfect, this is what, in his case, Wonder Woman should do. In our case, these are what these students at this school should be. To have someone undo it hurts. But you also have to recognize the next writer in wants to put their mark on the mythology. And sometimes the only way to do it is to change the status quo and to mix things up. Mm. So I think when it happened um, to him, he was not happy. When it happened to us, we sort of were looking at him like, oh, come on. <laughs> They they took out your chronology, like the, the the your backstory for Wonder Woman was changed. Okay, but they put thirty eight of our kids on a bus and they blew them up. Like there's I mean crimes and then there's crimes. You know, like yeah. you got a pretty strong fallback when somebody else complains. You just, exactly, <laughs> it's true. And and you know, you go back to Wonder Woman in that case, you can put some of that stuff back. If we went back yeah. to X Men. We would have to resurrect those kids. It's a lot harder to do. Well, there are just so many timelines. So, yeah. yeah. I mean, yeah, there you go, timelines. Have somebody control time and reverse it. McAvoy or Stewart, I can't keep these timelines straight. Fortunately, one of the kids we created it was a healer who we said had the ability to affect life and death at a cellular level. Oh, so wow. if ever we got back, he'd just bring back his friends. Yeah. yeah. But was he on the bus? <laughs> Messing with time. No, he was not. He made it. <laughs> no, Marvel does that too. Yeah, we, have, we, you know, we see something here that like messing with time is a DC thing. Yeah. Messing with time is a DC thing. Uh, messing with life and death, though, every comic publisher does it. Yeah. Like, Marvel really invented that with Phoenix. Oh, oh well, but at dead, least alive, dead, alive, dead, alive. But at least like, that is like written into her character. Mm -hmm. Like it's, it's literally her name. Yeah, <laughs> it is her name. There are so many other characters that you're like, back again. I see for the fourth <laughs> time. Mm -hmm. Fancy well, that. I, I actually feel like with Phoenix, it was too much. Yeah. The back, the fourth, the back, and forth. And I think a lot of writers who came after us and. For us, Phoenix wasn't a factor. She wasn't part of the teaching staff, and the, uh, the, the main X Men only appeared in our book when they were teaching our kids classes, and so she wasn't there. Um, but a lot of writers are struggled with that. If you if you kill her, everyone knows she's going to come back. And if you bring her back, if she's done it so often, you're not going to get any credit for doing something cool with it. So you can't kill her, and you can't bring her back. So they don't know necessarily what to do with her. Lock her yeah. away. <laughs> well, <laughs> I, I think I think I don't know. It has to do. It has to do with like exploring other aspects of, of her because she has so many powers the power of a generator resurgence isn't the only that's true you she, know like I, I feel like they could go I don't know she, she, she was could eat a planet I mean there was that she was one of or my star, favorites I think it was a star yeah, she was one of my favorites yeah, too I loved her com combination of powers so yeah that, my, my all time was Aurora Monroe though well um, for us when one of the great things when we were writing X-Men is that our the, these not Phoenix specifically but these other X-Men were the teachers 
So we kept wanting to put in scenes where our characters would interact with the main X-Men and learn things from them. And so we had a character named Wind Dancer who controlled the wind. Mm -hmm. And we kept saying, do we have Storm yet? Is Storm back at the school? Is she teaching? Can we use her? We want <laughs> Storm to be with Wind Dancer and teaching her things to do with wind and then Wind Dancer to have things that she does because all she does is wind that Storm has never thought of that Storm would be surprised by. Right. And, and we kept like we kept asking for that scene, and I don't think we ever got a chance no, to write it. No, we didn't get it too. Oh man, sad. That sounds like a good one too. And we had we had we, we did sight we had Cyclops in there, we had Wolverine in there, so we got to do scenes with some of the big names. But oh, that's awesome. Does when when dancer ever say I'm a leaf on the wind? Please tell me. Ah, how does it how does it work? Like you you're saying that you have to talk to people to get these. We you know we want Cyclops to come into this scene like. Well, the the thing about the, uh, a superhero comic is that it's part of a line, mm -hmm. and there's a part of the 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 smaller line, like the X Men books. All the X Men books are one line, and then there's the Marvel universe proper, and there's things going on at both levels that your book can't disrupt. Oh, and I so see. at the status quo of the X Men at the time, there were specific X Men who were at the school teaching, and other X Men were on teams like Extreme X-Men or something that where they never went back to the school and they were constantly off fighting battles. So I and Storm was on, I think, Extreme X-Men at the time. So she Is there like back. five five to ten X-Men titles at any given time? Mm -hmm. Like they break them off into so many different books and do Oh my another. gosh. I uh, Honestly, for me, it's so hard to keep track of it. Like I know if I sit down and like map it out, I can do it. <laughs> But honestly, every time I see one, it's just like, oh, okay, they're doing this now. <laughs> so, I don't question it. I'm just like, this is the yeah, universe. I have never <laughs> read comics chronologically. It's always like out of order or like if um, if there's one that I find particularly interesting, like when I found out that freaking Captain America was going to be in Hydra, <laughs> I was like, I guess I'm going to read this and in, in Marvel's defense, Hydra is not necessarily Nazi in their current chronology. I think it... I think they're doing a lot of what they did in Agents of S.H.I.E.L.D. saying that it predates the Nazis and it co-opted the Nazis. But I to mean, all of us, to most, like, Nazis, certainly you see the right, movie. Hydra. You, you, see, you see the Captain Bubble. America movie with, with Chris Evans and yeah. Hydra will be Nazis in your head. So yeah. Yeah. I, Mar Marvel can say, oh, don't equate them. But they wanted this. Yeah. Um, because they wanted the strong reaction, and then they wanted whatever it is they're going to do that turns it on its head to make everyone go, oh, I was wrong, this is great storytelling. That's really what they're waiting for. There's yeah. going to be a point where they flip a switch and everybody goes, oh, that's where you're going. Well, it's like what you were saying with Phoenix. They had to come up with something big. Mm -hmm. It was like, surprise. Yeah. yeah. So <laughs> going to hate this. <laughs> <laughs> what is your, what are y'all's favorite... Um, We'll go with X Men. What are y'all's favorite X Men lines? Like X Men um, worlds. Um, my favorite X Men is the is the Claremont, the classic Claremont era, um, the, the the Dark Phoenix mm -hmm. saga, the original Hellfire Club stories, um, his, his Wolverine miniseries. Like those those are the things that I responded to. That's the stuff I grew up. And that's eighties, right? Yeah, eighties. Yeah, yeah. And then I sort of grew up. I was you know I fell in love with. Rogue. That was well. That, that was that, that was like that when I was reading X Men, the the I can't touch anyone because my power yeah. will hurt or kill them. That was too cool for me. Like that, like uh, she was a broken heart, and I, I read the books like somebody love Rogue, yeah. please. <laughs> yeah. Then Gambit came yeah. along, and I was like, not him. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> not you though. <laughs> you can have Jubilee. Yeah. <laughs> Get back. out. Take it back. Yeah, I. Uh, I think... <laughs> Did I say somebody love Rogue? No, no, not him. No. <laughs> Yeah, I would say that uh, that was probably for me that like I I stopped reading X Men I would say like ninety four ninety five and I obviously because I was born eighty six but I was stealing my sister's comics so I read them up until current of ninety four and then after that I just kind of See, I, I didn't have money to don't read comics and there you had like a sister oh, to steal from yeah and exactly like, that's great there my sister there's also an X Men Alpha Flight crossover where Loki kidnapped. Uh, Storm mm -hmm. to make her the new god of thunder to replace Thor and the X-Men and Alpha Flight like the first half is X-Men and Alpha Flight find this thing where Loki's giving humanity all everything it wants and the second half he kidnaps uh, um, Storm and they all have to go into Asgard to save her and those two different miniseries probably my favorite X-Men stuff oh, that's cool. a little bit more obscure and it in that there was this there's a there's a the first one the Alpha Flight crossover there's a 
connection between Rogue and North Star that I really responded to. And when I was younger, I didn't get that North Star was processing being gay. Ah. And then when I read it later, it had a completely different meaning. And so it worked. <laughs> and, it worked on both levels. Well, it was really nice. Yeah, and like that. If I and I, I mean, guys, this is going back like twenty years mm-hmm. for me. But like this, that was when he was dealing with fallout from his father. Right? Was that the same character? Which North Star? Yeah. It was. It, it mostly was, it was him and his sister. His sister. He had a twin sister, and they were really close. And then she'd gone off to become someone else and start her own life and left him behind and nobody understood him oh okay no then i'm thinking of completely different one. what about you <laughs> um i think i was reading because since i came to comics late and all that like i can't think of specific storylines i know i just always loved anything with gene gray uh i love kitty pride so what about you you got comics what's your favorite I comic character i was never the flash straight off that's an easy one so to which, DC flash. Guy. which flash hang on uh, barry allen okay I'm I'm gonna, just, I'm, I'm i know i'm just you're you I know, watch it I saw it was on there, and that's why. Ta-da. Well, they can't see. You guys are way over there today. <laughs> <laughs> that's the yeah. only reason why I wanted that watch is because I can have that logo. Yeah. But it's most of what I, most of what I learned actually came from TV shows rather than mm-hmm. comics. Mm-hmm. I didn't read comics. The John Wesley that. Ship. Flash so I was gonna say, yeah, you show? watched the original. Yeah. The Flash. Nice. Yeah, I ret- <laughs> I, it blew my mind. What, okay, I'm not gonna I'm not gonna say anything else in case other people haven't seen it. But it's it blew my mind. Um, what they did in the new show? Yes. yes. Yeah, yeah, you know what I'm talking about. <laughs> As a fan of both the new show and the old show. Um, oh, yeah. <laughs> I, think, I think the new Flash show is wonderful about paying homage to the old Flash show. Oh, it's incredible. That's I awesome. love it. It's There's ridiculous. absolute love for the show that came before. Um, yeah, especially if you know and, what's coming. You can and, see all the little tidbits. And, and as a, we back. were saying about the X-Men, it hurts to watch all your characters get blown up on a bus, but you recognize that's what has to happen in mm-hmm. this in this industry. It has to sort of tear itself down and, and then build itself back up. So it's so rare to see something that is new, that is taking the place of something else, that doesn't have to tear any of it down, in a sense. It obviously can't exist, because this is Barry Allen, not that. Right. But they get to turn around and say, but we loved it too. Exactly, and they found a way to make it work. Mm-hmm. Awesome. Um, but as far as comic books go, I, I was kind of like all over the place. Like I, I still have pretty much all the comic books I ever bought. My favorite one was probably this really thick uh, Batman graphic novel. It was about this big, and it had like Killer Croc in it. Um, that's about all I remember. <laughs> uh, but it had like three different stories in there, and it had Killer Croc, uh, Two Face, and somebody else that I can't remember off the top of my head. But I remember being up. I read that. That's probably one of the few that I've read like more than twice. And I went through that. That took me a while too. So. Uh, Westward has a question for us. Okay. It says, uh, what is the difference in writing for the different companies? Well, it depends. The the first Marvel and DC, that they're very similar experiences that we've had. Um, and then there's something like Oni Press, where you're creating um, your own stuff, and that's a radically different experience. And then recently we worked with Dark Horse and Bioware on Dragon Age Knight Errant, and that's a little bit closer to the DC Marvel, but yet a completely different experience for us. DC and Marvel are not that different in that these are characters with a massive history, mm-hmm. and you're the caretaker of that history. So everything you do has to be approved by somebody up the, up the ladder from you. And so if you're sitting there saying, but I'm an artist and this is my vision, you're just going to be clashing with them all the time. So you have to recognize Batman is more important than you are. No matter what yeah. writer you are, no matter how good a writer you are, when you're writing Batman, Batman is more important than you are. When you're writing Batman. the X-Men, <laughs> every one of the X-Men is more important than, than you are. Even the characters we created, whether they get put on a bus or blown up or whatever it is, um, they for that moment are more important because they represent the student body of Xavier's right. or the newest member of the X-Men or whatever person you put into that universe. They represent the culmination of decades. Um, we're closing in on a century for a character like Superman. Yeah. And so you have to be very careful when it comes to picking your battles, I'm sure. Yeah. So and, there's, because and, there could be something that works very well, like an idea you have that works very well for a character mm-hmm. and somebody else might not be buying it. And so you kind of have that little headbutt stuff, and yeah. so it comes well, down to well, that. Well, there's some, two things. There's, yeah. both, there's both the, the image of the character, like the legacy that you're leaving for the character, and then there's the, the fact, as I was saying, you know, there can be five to ten X-Men books. So you have to know what every single other person is doing so that you don't tell one story that contradicts with another story right. and sort of keep that you mm-hmm. know, all straight. Yeah, DCT's asking about that. He says, is it true that these two companies, Marvel and DC, 
to have like a giant Bible that they use. That is just I, I can't say for timeline. certain that there's like one book, or, the, but they yeah, have to when, keep track of When we that. were working at DC or, and at Marvel, there was no Bible that we knew of, but you would always contact your editor and say, is it true that this hero once did this thing? Can we bring that back? Is that currently part of canon, part of the history, or is it no longer part? So you would, like, we would do the research. We would figure out, oh, here's this piece of history we might want to use, but we'd have to then go back to them. Is this part of continuity? Um, and in a lot of cases, the answer would be no, but hey, if you want to bring it back, you get to invent your own version. And for us, with Batman Confidential, we did King Tut, oh, but from cool. the TV show. And so the TV show King Tut is not a part of Batman continuity. So they, they put him in, they snuck him in some panels on some covers so people would think, oh, is King Tut actually part of it? But they didn't own the rights because yeah. of the TV show. So when we created, we said we want to use King Tut. And actually that came from our editor. He said, why don't you use King Tut? And then he then turned around and said, okay, you can't use King Tut the way he was. Why don't you create a new King Tut? And so we did. Um, That's and cool. so. Yeah, and that was that was actually a whole lot of fun. But more fun for me on Batman Confidential was working with the Riddler. Um, oh yes, it's like writing the Riddler is there. There's a list of dream, there's though, a right? list of yeah. characters. Speaking of watching terribly <laughs> Batman Forever last night, <laughs> um, there are characters that when you go into writing superhero comics, every one of us will have a list. I want to write this person or that person, and it's different for each of us. Um, I have a list, and the the villain who's highest on the list is the Riddler. So in writing Batman Confidential, it was a so life goal achieved. Mm, that's you know, like, awesome. He so. also made sure that we wrote a page that would allow the artist to do a head-to-toe shot of the Riddler so that he's standing there, you know, posing, looking all suave. And... So he framed it and put it in our <laughs> office. There you go. That's yes! <laughs> that's so cool. Um, I know that we, you guys sent along uh, quite a few like stills and everything mm. like that. So I don't know. Are they they're going? Okay, cool. So hopefully <laughs> you guys at home can see what we're all talking about here. Um so what was it like writing for the Batman DC universe? Well, we were writing on a book called Batman Confidential, which was interesting because it was in continuity, but not in continuity. It was all, so whatever Batman was doing at the time didn't matter to us. And it gave us a little bit more freedom because mm. the book was saying, here are some undiscovered tales from Batman's oh, history. Oh, that's so cool. So, yeah, so they're not looking, placed anywhere specifically in the but timeline. The book was that. officially canon. So the, the adventures we had would go into Batman's chronology, but they would go in years ago or months ago so at the time we were writing uh batman confidential i think bruce wayne was dead i think that and was so when he was, yeah we were here we were writing this throwback batman story so it's batman the king tut comes into town and he starts killing people and he leaves riddles and batman goes to the riddler saying this is you doing this and the riddler's like no i'm angry he's stealing my shtick yeah huh. <laughs> Let me out of here and I'll help you. And when Batman doesn't let him out of there, Riddler escapes. And Batman's like, see, this is proof that he did it. And eventually they have to team up to stop King Tut. And then they wind up in a sort of Indiana Jones style adventure with death traps and things and puzzles based on mythology that they have to solve. So it was very old school. Batman as detective, Indiana Jones style adventure, classic Riddler being not quite good, not quite bad. And so... There was a lot of response at the time of, this is what Batman should be. And they would make fun of the other books. And we were like, wow. no, no, we're not criticizing. Wow. We're just getting to write <laughs> Batman historically. I feel like that's how Batman should be, though. <laughs> well, I mean, that's, like you said, it's going back to yeah. the old school Batman. And now nowadays, Batman's just kind of like, mm, I'm dark. I'm angry. <laughs> Give me a better gun. Problem solved. Yeah, it's like, Batman no... uses guns in today's comics? I'm sorry. He yeah, doesn't, he doesn't Batman v Superman. Okay, Give me another gadget, oh, no, 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 not oh, gun. Yeah, yeah. No, but he, he used a gun Batman in Batman v yeah, Superman. Yeah, 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 no, oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. But I, I, I was about to get really upset and like flip the table. <laughs> <laughs> no, he doesn't. no, I think in the comics they've been pretty good about keeping yeah. him away from yeah. guns. No, what yeah. an that's, honor that's that is, though, for you guys to to hear that from people saying, like, this is what Batman should be. Like, what did that feel like? Hugely flattering. Um you know, at the end of the day, the sales on Batman um, Confidential are not as high as the main Batman book. So more people were seeing what was going on over there. And this was just a small corner of fandom. Right. But when you hear something like that, you, know, you can't help but it. It doesn't matter. Good. Yeah. Um, so and that's and that's what that was for us. It was it was an affirmation also that we got Batman. Because mm. the, the, the other problem with working in that form is that the fans have ownership almost as much, if not more, than the publishers. Mm. And with the publishers have to physically have ownership and be the caretakers. But there are going to be fans who are like, I've been reading this longer than the editor-in-chief. 
I know. Batman I know Batman better. better yeah. I know Batman better than whoever's writing it, whoever's editing it, whoever's publishing it. Um, and that's a, a huge gap between fan and and publisher. So when a writer feels like, oh, I fell on the right side of that gap, where the publisher is happy, and like yeah. there isn't a gap in that moment, that feels good. That's well, awesome. I mean, because there's definitely a lot of lore in these universes that you have to keep track of. But it's used, yeah. as you mm-hmm. said, because you could be reading it before the head exec has been this mm-hmm. whole time. And I remember there was at a BlizzCon uh, a few years ago, there was actually, they were talking about the new lore that's coming out, the new storyline, and one of the kids stood up. It's like, excuse me, but doesn't that contradict (laughs) this and everything? They're like, is that true? (laughs) It sounds like something we could have written. I don't know. That's probably true. And it's like, so I I know what you're saying when it comes to the fans and the producers. There are people who take take their fandom so seriously. It is, it's a world they've lived in. Mm-hmm. And when it's your job to write in that world, it's foolish to just listen to them, but it's foolish to ignore them too. Like you have yeah. to weigh it. Yeah, I was just say going back to Marvel when we first uh, took over with New Mutants and we brought Rain back, who was one of the characters from the eighties. Yeah. yeah, the eighties New the, Mutants book. Um, she had always traditionally spoken with a really thick Scottish accent that was written out phonetically. We had decided, like, we don't want to try and write a phonetic Scottish <laughs> accent. Also, she's been living in this country for how long? She might not have her accent anymore. <laughs> it's phased out by now. So we just, and, but there were fans who were like, where's her accent? Wow. You know, and it's like, oh, gosh. There was one fan gonna... on a message board who sort of became friends with us, but kept arguing with us, no, you have to put that accent back <laughs> As huh. a mutant, you can change anything you want, except your accent. Except the accent. <laughs> yeah. um, All right, so. Let's see. Westward, how did you work with the artists when writing the books? Like, what was that well, collaboration? This also will take us back to that uh, the previous question, also, I think, by, by Westward, about the difference between publishers. When you're working at a smaller press, when we're working with Oni Press, we're on the phone with the artists. Um, sometimes, if you're in the same city, you're having coffee with the artists, you're sitting down and talking about it. So, what are what do you want to do with this Im- this uh, this this issue? What do you want to do with this image? This moment um, through DC and Marvel, the editor is the gatekeeper of all communication. So you'll send stuff to the editor, and the editor will send it to the artist, and the artist will have concerns and send it back. But the primary way to communicate with an artist is through your script. And it's we've worked in a couple of public uh, with a couple of publishers, and it's mostly for original English language manga that we've written, where we've written screenplay format, but all of our DC and Marvel work, our Dragon Age work now, our, our creator-owned stuff at, at Oni, all of that is done in comic format. And so they're different. there's no official comic format the way there is in a screenplay format. It's right. like it, it has to look like this. In comic format, there's different ways to write. They can be loose where you say, this is what happens on the page and this is what people say. And then the artist decides how many panels that will be. And then there is what uh, sort of a tight script or all the way to a full script where you've decided what's in every panel. And wow. so you're, you're, you're not just writing, you're kind of doing a little directing too because you're talking about angles. Um, so I imagine with, that, that lead to a little bit of clashing. Well, you know, I things. think we've discovered that, that plenty of artists actually like a tight script. They don't necessarily like it when you give them shots all the time. They, they sort of feel like that's theirs. But if you say what's going to be in each panel, it gives them something to draw. Other artists might be saying, hey, you're stepping on my creative freedom. So you learn while working with an artist how much yeah. freedom yeah. to give them. And we saw a script once, because uh, as we were saying in the superhero books, when, you, when you're when you writing something that's affected by something in another book, sometimes you have to check what's going on. So we would see stuff that was going on in other X-Men books when we were working on X-Men. And we saw uh, a Wolverine issue where the writer basically said, okay, the next three pages are a fight between Wolverine and Iron Man. This should be an amazing fight. Here are the, a couple of things that need to happen. Knock yourself out. Yeah. And that's what they wrote to the artist. And the rest of the script was exactly what we did, which was panel by panel. But in that moment, the writer said, you're the artist. You're going to yeah. do this better than we ever could. I'm just going to hand this over to you. And that's one way to make sure your artist isn't upset that you're taking control, is if you let it go. Like if you have it at first. The other way to do it is we put artist notes in our script that say, you know, so-and-so, whatever her, his or her name is. This is what we were going for here, but if you can think of a better way to do this. Yeah, ideally we get to write how we see it, what we're visualizing, and then it'll come back maybe some version of that where they're like, no, it works better if I do this. And we're like, oh my gosh, yes, you're right. It does work so much better if you do that. What's yeah. the what's the back and forth like with that? So like, I'm the artist, you're the writer. 
you send me something, I draw it, and then I send it back. And if you're like, I, I hate this. Well, so like, I, ideally, because their job, I hate to admit it, is much harder than ours. Like, you know, putting words on a page is far simpler than actually drawing people in spaceships and whatever. But um, most artists sketch things out. They do what's called thumbnails, like really casual little drawings to get an idea of the layout of the page. So... You know, ideally they send that to you so you can see right away like, oh gosh, no, I feel like I really need a big panel on this. And they can be like, okay, well, what about this layout? And then they usually do kind of loose pencils. And again, like if there's something we don't like or we think doesn't work for the story, like we really want to catch it early because once they've done oh that God, full yes. on like drawing, like inked everything, to be like, can you redraw that panel? It's sort that's, of like... And that's yeah. the worst. Like there would be times where we had a lot of artists come and go when we were on New Mutants and New X-Men. Um, there seemed to be almost a... Uh, uh, revolving door of artists yeah. and so we never quite hit a rhythm with artists and so a lot of the first issues that they had um there would be things that we'd have to send back to the editor and say no there's something missing here and so we once had a scene where there was a panel and both characters who were supposed to speak in the panel were not in it <laughs> um have you ever because you were talking about the multiple uh series and the multiple worlds and everything mm -hmm. like that have you ever written in a specific like a potted plant or something like that that ties in between like multiple versions because i love looking for little <laughs> continuity things. not in our, our marvel and dc we don't want to create continuity accidentally or as a as a gag so when we did that we didn't do it um working uh with dark horse and bioware we're working with a fairly large stable and a pretty big pre-existing video game universe. So we have the ability to drop in cameos from characters mm. from the previous Dragon Age games, and that's been fun. But in our creator-owned work at Oni, there's a, every book that we've done has had the name Walensky in it. Um, and so we imagine there's this big Walensky family that exists in our universe <laughs> that ties all of our books together in one big continuity. And then we actually started doing that in our screenplay. So we'll have pilots and screenplays that are unproduced where there's a Walensky in it. Um, just I, keep doing I, it. I like that. Because like, like I said, I like looking for the little, the little things. And, and this is because... A college roommate of mine. Last name Walensky. Last name was Walensky. We, just, we put it in once and then the next time we wrote we thought, another Walensky? <laughs> That's yeah. what sometimes that's how you get the best stuff. It's yeah. just you pull it out of nowhere and it like becomes a huge thing. So so let's talk a little bit about this stuff that you're doing with Bioware. You uh, you have a comic that you wrote. Are, are, it's not a comic. It's a mini series. Yes, right? it is. So and it's called Dragon Age Knight Errant. Yes, um, it's sort of a expanding out the existing Dragon Age universe, creating some new characters who are running into old characters. So if you've, if you've played Dragon Age, we've got characters like Varric and Sebastian. Mm -hmm. um, Varric is in both uh, Dragon Age 2 and Dragon Age Inquisition, and Sebastian was in Dragon Age 2. And so they, they play roles in this story, but the, the leads are completely new characters that we created. Oh, cool. Um, that we then ran by the Bioware guys and our editors of Dark Horse, and they tweaked them to make sure that it fit with what the way the politics of that world and the history of that world right. uh, play out. Right. I'll have to look out for them then because I've, I've downloaded my first Dragon Age. I think it was Inquisition. Mm -hmm. I downloaded it not long ago. Mm -hmm. I played it for like 30 minutes and it was fun, but then I had to leave and I've been so busy I haven't been It's, it's it a big game. <laughs> it will take hours and hours yeah. of your life. I can see that. <laughs> the Dragon Age, I, I, I'm a huge, huge Bioware nerd. Like the Mass Effect games, right. the, the, the Dragon Age games. These are some of my favorite franchises of video games. Um, and what I love about the Dragon Age game is they keep expanding out this fantasy world that they've created. And it is so clear how much thought they put into the world, the politics of the world, the religion of the world, the magic of the world. It all makes sense across three games so far and numerous DLC uh, packs. Um, the miniseries is going to... Uh, the reason it's called Night Errant is that there's a character who is a washed-up, drunken ex-knight. And all he nice. does now is he wanders from castle to castle telling people his stories. And he has a squire like with him, an elven squire named Vaya, who he doesn't know it is a thief. So wherever he goes, she just steals from the castles he's visiting. That's so great. Oh, I thought like... Not from... You know, like, no, she's yeah, a, I thought like she didn't oh, know it herself. No, no, she's the... just like yeah. a klepto. So, she's so, just... Look at this art. So yeah, you, if you can see there... That's Sir Aaron taking a tour of the city of Kirkwall, which was the location of Dragon Age 2, 
with Varric Tethras, who's probably everybody's favorite character in the entire Dragon Age universe, certainly mine. Um, he's the dwarf in the front. Um, and then Vaya is his squire. And he has come for the coronation of sorts for Varric to become the Viscount of the city. Mm. And so he's come just to entertain the new Viscount with his tales, and she's come because Good. somebody in the city yeah. needs something stolen. Exactly. <laughs> I like this. I like this. This is cool. When so then? How long have you been working on this for? Uh, we just finished up. Well, it's been a few. What, what has it been like six months actually that yeah. we've been working yeah. on it. Yeah, the first uh, issue is coming out early next month. I think May tenth. Oh, yeah. 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 And it'll be available pretty much at any comic store. So that's so cool. Ooh, I gotta hit them up. And then we can come and get it autographed, right? <laughs> Sure. 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 Why not? That's actually a really good. Wow. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> no, I, my idea. For those of you, for those of you who do not know, I am the chair of the screenwriting department at NIFA. I'm also the dean of faculty at NIFA, so I actually have my own office. Oh my god! Loaded, loaded with our comic books on, on a shelf, so I get to show off. Uh, American Pie has a pretty interesting question. Why did they decide to limit the character choices so severely in Dragon Age Two? You can only be a human or a uh, or a dwarf, not elf, like the first one. Well, I can't speak to the the narrative choices made by Bioware on that game, the but I can game, say yeah. that the original game, Dragon Age Origins, had you play multiple, like you could have different protagonists with different story points like where they started and then it all converged and then they got swept up into this big destiny and then the original point that you chose would have these ripple effects through which subquest you would encounter oh. how people would react to you because they react very differently to a dwarf than they do an elf but the second game was very specifically one person's story um who had a family who left this town and then they came back to this town and picked up their family history. And so since you were falling into one family, they had to predetermine what that family was and it was human. And so you had a choice of male or female, you had a choice of warrior, rogue, or mage, mm -hmm. but they had to limit the choices to that because the the family backstory was a huge piece of what was going on right. in the story. So, so as a player, I understood that that limit. I don't know why uh, Bioware made that choice, but it worked for me because the scale of the second Dragon Age was much smaller. It was much more one person and their group of friends changing the fate of one city. Oh, I think cool. that's kind of what threw me off for a while because I remember hearing people talk about how it was an amazing game of this whole expansive universe, and then I remember seeing a friend play the second mm -hmm. one. And it was the same thing. You were just the guy. And it was like, oh, that's kind of... I think... I, I, I guess it's I, cool. I don't it's know how many and of the people, or how, if, whether you guys do this or anybody who's watching, plays role-playing games like Dungeons & Dragons, those types of games. Shut up! Why is everybody <laughs> looking at me? <laughs> but the thing what? that I loved about Dragon Age 2 is it felt like a campaign that you would play in a role-playing game where you and your team would have, over the course of a few years change the city that you had made as your adventuring base. Like every wow. time you go out, you do these adventures, and when you'd come back, you'd see how the city would change by the fact that you uh, got into this battle with the leader of this race called the Kunari. Like, and so mm -hmm. as a gamer, I think I appreciated the small... Like I, I, and and I, when we game, I'm often the game master or the dungeon master, so I love creating big, expansive worlds, but there are times that you almost long for something that is smaller and more self-contained, mm -hmm. that your players can really see it through from the beginning, through the middle to the end. And I think that's what they were trying right. to do. But again, you'd have to talk yeah. to the Bioware guys about whether that was what they intended or just the way I took it. But that's, well, no. that, I think, was why I loved it, because um, it was a change of pace. And that's not to say I don't love Dragon Age Origins or Inquisition, because those both have much more massive scopes for me. Because right now, I know exactly what you're talking about, going back uh, you know, to simpler time when mm -hmm. you had the, mm -hmm. this is how it's going, this is, mm -hmm. I've got my mission, yeah. but there were so many options in Inquisition <laughs> yeah. just for like making your character. There were. No, and I think, and, and those are so back long. in those, yeah, like those are, those, those are most of those options except for Canari were available in Origins and they were back in, um, in Inquisition. But what I really like is that the smaller scale of two, when you play Inquisition, having played two, all of the decisions you're making in Inquisition have extra weight because you played this smaller scale, more personal story in two. Right. And so, to me, it's worth it if you're going to go back and not just to not just play Inquisition, but to play the whole series through mm -hmm. because Origins is going to build an expansive world. Inquisition uh, Two is going to say, "Here's one corner of it. Let's really dig in so you understand how these characters react, how these races interact, how the politics of mage non-mage play out." 
And then the third is like, and then we're going to blow it all up <laughs> as big as possible and turn, take this entire gigantic world that we've created and make them go to war. And because of that, I, I, I felt like because we saw what one town would go through in a battle, war meant something different in Inquisition if you played two than it would have if you just dove into Inquisition. So, so what you're saying is that if they don't see me here at work for like the next four <laughs> months, I'll be like, well, Nunzia told me to stay home. And yeah, there are, there are several Dragon hundred Age. hours worth of well, gameplay between yeah, the three of them. You need to play all the Dragon Age games and all the Mass Effect games, because the Mass Effect games are their own like cool. Oh, absolutely. Well, now we're talking about total social isolation. <laughs> yes, now that is... know, it's not even just a little bit. Um, I do want to say that like, if you ever have an opening in your campaign, I yeah. think it would be so cool <laughs> to play... With a DM who is literally like a comic book writer, <laughs> like that yeah, has to be fascinating. fascinating. He, he, he's he's very good at it. He he's also a little over controlling in terms of how he likes to I think, play out his I role. think the term you're looking for, I and I don't mean this in any official <laughs> psychiatric uh, diagnostic and statistical manual kind of way, OCD. Yes, he has a little OCD. <laughs> um, maybe you don't but, want me to. This is my very first campaign, mm -hmm. but I love it. It's so much fun. I'm obsessed. And the thing, that's it. another thing I did not do as a kid, that he had to introduce me to the whole concept of gaming. And when we first... I started, didn't do that. that well, we I was we saying, went to Disneyland with my best friend, the one who got us into comics, Greg Rucka. He sat me down at Disneyland and said, you cannot date a gamer without becoming a gamer. So you now need to be a gamer. And I was like, no I don't pressure. even know what you're talking about. Like weeks into the relationship. <laughs> oh, no. Part of the ship, part of the crew. But it's addictive. <laughs> it's so much fun. Yeah. I mean, just creating your character, diving into the world. Yeah. Like, I, have, I have to join up with you guys and do this because I have never played this before and you guys constantly talk about I'm, it. Yeah. Her especially every time. And it's like, it sounds so much before fun. Before I like, actually I'm, played, I didn't quite stuff. get it. Like I'd hear him talking mm -hmm. about their campaigns and their stories and their adventures and I'm like, but but what do you do? <laughs> like I didn't quite understand. Until you, until you play a role playing game, you never actually understand what it is you're doing in a role playing yeah. game. It's one of those things you have to Just take down. someone by the hand and say, let us show you. <laughs> yes. And then once you see it, it's either Something you totally get, or something you're like, please never again. Yeah. So my strategy of just run in and shoot things. No, no, would not work. Like you could go, like we have. Oh my god, we're not going to get into it. But we have, <laughs> we have a paladin who should not be a paladin, <laughs> and he is the he is like I. In the last game, I called him a walking garbage fire because that is <laughs> what he is to this campaign right now. Uh, bless maybe, him. Well, maybe you, maybe he's a fallen paladin. Maybe no 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 not yet. <laughs> he's trying. He literally just attempted to sell his soul to the devil, okay. and his squire was like, and like cold cocked him. He like the squire knocked out his own knight. Nice. Just nice. because he was like like literally about to sign on the dotted line, and he rolls like a nat twenty and just. Text the guy. Well, it's so hilarious. The thing is, this Dragon Age Knight Aaron, the characters in it, the two lead characters, Sir Aaron and Vaya, Vaya. Um, are from a role playing campaign. That, that was we, where we uh, first conceived them. And that's they were, so cool. They were non player characters. They weren't. They weren't yeah. like her character or one of our friends' characters. They were sort of characters that their group of player characters had to interact with. Right. I um, mean, it was very different when we did it. It was more. This 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 guy, Sir Aaron, is much more sort of a PTSD type character. Mm. Like he, he's broken because of what he's seen in war, mm -hmm. and the other one was much more Dudley Do Right, just wandering into oh, right, right, right. Um, almost laughable. Um, he's much more heartbreaking in this story, um, and I think that part of that came from talking to the the guys at, at, at Bioware and at Dark Horse, who were both saying you can do more with this character. Right. And I think when he's in a role playing game. He's just there for comic relief for he, her, yeah, for her he characters, was her and her and our friends' characters' adventures. But once they moved to the center, they had the honest question of like, "Can't you get more story out of this mm -hmm. guy? Um, and what would it be to be his squire?" Why don't we talk about the? This is the cover art, right? Yeah, yes, this is Vaya, the the Elven squire. And that is the tree that is at the center of all of the elven alienages. Within the Dragon Age universe, the elves are either out in the forest or they live in the city. Mm -hmm. If they live in the city, the alienages are the, uh, the slums where they are sent to live. They don't get to live with the humans. No. And they have a tree at the center, which is the center of spiritual and, and communal life in the, in, the, in the village. And that issue, in addition to advancing the current storyline... Uh, that we're following in the miniseries also jumps back to show us how Baya became the thief that she is. And it has to lo a lot to do with the alien that she grew up in. The the two names, the Fernando and Michael, are they the artists? Yes. Uh, Fernando is our artist and um, 
trying to remember if Michael is our colorist, colorist I think. Oh, okay. Um, sadly, the letterers rarely get cover of mention, and they should, because good lettering is huge <laughs> to a comic. Oh, we've got a question from American. Uh, in the comics, do they ever lighten up on the use of blood magic? You're going to have to let me know what happens. <laughs> okay. Blood magic is... It's a sort of forbidden form of magic in the Dragon Age universe well, take it that involves the, the communing uh, with, uh, with with demons, mm. and it, it involves blood sacrifice. You have to use your own blood to fuel the magic, mm. um, and it has been central to a lot of the storylines in Dragon Age. I will say, for the record, blood magic is not the words "blood magic" are not uttered once in this miniseries. It's not a factor in what we're doing. <laughs> there you go. Um, the backdrop of the war between mages and Templars, which was fueled by blood magic, that is still a factor in what's going on. But, um, and red lyrium and things like that that are associated with that war do come up from time to time, but they're not... It, this is much more about people who are making bad choices getting swept up into bigger things via... By, stealing the way she does gets swept up in things involving the inquisition that she desperately does not want to have a cause yeah. a her own life tells her getting uh, having a cause is a bad thing and b she's following a knight who is now a drunken mess of a man because he was nothing but causes before that wow so brief question i have and you can just answer it like yes or no because i it's it okay so my question is does is there an explanation for the uh, for the hatred of the mages in the original Dragon Age? Because I found that going into Inquisition, I found that very interesting. I saw that right off the bat. That there's well, I think in their mythology, the they've built a religion that's based on the notion that the mages decided to touch heaven, and they journeyed to heaven, and in so doing, they turned it basically into hell. Hmm. And then they created the plague that is the dark spot on the universe. So they are responsible for all the evils in the world. Okay. <laughs> I, <laughs> I didn't mean, know that. So I'm usually like, go mages. But that's right. not necessarily. <laughs> they, they make it clear that something happened. Um, that something happened in history that was interpreted this way. They also make it clear that the church interpreted it this way <laughs> to make people hate, to hate magic. So it's not that somebody did something that created the dark spawn. Right, and the church posited it as... Mages journeyed to heaven and 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 destroyed it. Ah, what's um, the mages side of it? The mages side of it, I don't know necessarily know <laughs> that they disagree with it. Um, most mages go, well, they didn't corrupt it; they just didn't know how to handle the power. Ah. That sounds but like a, a lot of the mages answer. also police themselves okay. too. They are afraid of blood magic too. So. Right. Um, DCT uh, wants to give you guys a shout out saying that it's honestly amazing to see you guys knowing all about this mythology from multiple shows just off the top of your head. <laughs> That's, That's all him. He has encyclopedic like memory. But it, it is also sort of the, the cost of doing business when you are working in big franchises. Oh, yeah. Um, when you're working in a big franchise, like if you're writing the X-Men, you're going to have to dive in and learn the X-Men lore if you didn't yeah. grow up with yeah. it. And so... If you're writing Dragon Age, you have to know Dragon Age lore. Now, one of the things that was great for us is we didn't have to study it to get this job or study it after getting this job. We played the games pretty intensively, and so we were a good fit for it. Um, and it was actually through Mass Effect that we got the job because Mass Effect 3 had a multiplayer mode. And we played multiplayer, and Patrick Weeks, one of the writers at Bioware, was playing multiplayer. So we, again, Greg Rucka, the source of all things. Um, Greg was... <laughs> the source was, of all things. <laughs> all things for us in comics go through him. Um, he had befriended Patrick, I think, at a convention, yeah. and then said, hey, let's... They, they, he played Ma Mass Effect multiplayer. Patrick, who wrote on Mass Effect and wrote on some of the Dragon Age stuff, um, he played Mass Effect multiplayer, so the two of them decided to team up and play, and we were the other two who rounded out their squad. And so we just were chatting with Patrick, and so Greg wrote Mage Killer, which was a previous Dragon Age miniseries, and when he left uh, to do more of his own stuff, and they, the Dark Horse thought they might want to do more Dragon Age miniseries, he mentioned to Patrick, hey, remember those guys you played multiplayer with? And then we talked with Patrick, and... Uh, Mike Laidlaw at at, at uh, Bioware and 
talked about what we thought about the series and some of the ideas we had, and this very thing, the fact that we know this world inside and out, I think is probably what got us that job because they don't have to train a writer to know the world if it's somebody who's been playing the games right. religiously. Exactly. Absolutely. Um, well, let's see. Uh, do you ever go back to the yeah. fade in the new series? We do not I, go to the fade in the new Amer series. American, go ahead. You can spam with questions as yeah. much as you like. I mean, that is why we are yeah. here. That is why um, they are here. Go ahead. Ask away. We do. And, we and like questions. There are three classes in the Dragon Age game. There's the, the warrior, the rogue, and the mage. And this story is based on Sir Aaron, who is a warrior, and Vaya, who is a rogue. So there isn't really a mage to take us into the Fade yeah. in the same way. And that's why the blood magic doesn't come up, the Fade doesn't come up. This is focused on a, a broken warrior and his rogue squire. criminal, but maybe <laughs> maybe with a heart of gold, we're not sure, rogue squire. Huh. Was it? Okay, we, we're getting some more here. Uh, do any of the decisions following the new series, like, are the dwarves still animosity? Do the dwarves still have animosity towards, towards the surface dwellers? Or are the doors to Arzamor open? Arzamor, Arzamor's doors, uh, how open they are depends on who you put on the throne. So I know that within the, the, the comics, there's an officially accepted canon as to who you, who was put on the throne, and we build off of that. But our story doesn't go back to Orzammar and doesn't really deal with the politics of the of the dwarves right now. So I I don't know, actually, off the top of my head, which decision is considered canon. I can't remember. Whether it is Balin or Harrowmont. So Congratulations I, on being able to stump him for the first time tonight. <laughs> Five points, Gryffindor! <laughs> Um, was it? But that that was something, especially because you said that you can't actually like get into the mages full playing the game like that. Because that that was one thing. Because like, I always love to play the mage mage mm -hmm. character, but I saw the extent of the extent of your magic is basically kind of like I have a sword and shield, fire in the face. There we go. And it was like, <laughs> well, it, get, it gets into it deeper. Like, it does. If you keep going. Yeah. Okay. Because yeah. in, in in Dragon Age two, if you play the game as a mage, it's a very different. Dragon experience. Age two is all about the mages. So like whether you play as a mage or not a mage, it becomes really central. Ah, yeah, Dragon I, Age I just the one I wanted. <laughs> in Dragon Age two, there's a city. The city, like we said, is Kirkwall, and that city has this other race called the Kunari that's camped out in there. And so for the longest time, you think the big conflict that's brewing is going to be between the various races of the city and the Kunari. But underneath everything that's going on in the first two acts of that game, it's about the simmering tensions between Mage and Templar. Mm -hmm. And so that, when when Act 3 comes, that's what really tears the city apart. And so where your character lands on that determines whether they tried to stop the city from falling apart or whether they lit the match. Oh, wow. I'd like that. I might have um, to go back and get this one. <laughs> American Pie uh, says that he feels like Retro Guy. Retro Guy's name is Sean. Yeah. You Hi. Can, you can find Sean on Instagram. <laughs> you can call me Retro Guy, though. I yeah, you that. can. It's yeah. fine. I'll be the first one on ground off the Star Trek. What's your, what's your Instagram? And dead. Yeah. And dead. It's, I did, yeah, I'm being optimistic here. Or, I'm, I'm the one that Or in the survive. reboot, you'll open your chute too late and die a different way. What's your What's your Instagram? How can Instagram they find is Seanbot two point and on Twitter I'm Sean Zeno with three N's if you want to count them out S E A N Z I N N O. There we go. Uh, I am on Instagram at Gina Teresa, and I don't Twitter because I suck at it and I never <laughs> remember to do it. Are you good? Do you guys have any social media for your comics or for anything? Uh, we have. <laughs> We're, we're old school because we're old. Um, we do. We have, we have a Facebook page, which does feel really old school at this we're point. We're like 12 people. <laughs> <laughs> nice. It's about to be 13, 14, 15, um, 16, 17. And then we're both on Twitter. Okay. Um, and I think I'm at ND Philippus. You are. And your profile picture is Varric. And my profile picture is Varric Tethris, yes. <laughs> cool. And so on Twitter, you're at, at, you're at ND. ND Philippus. And I believe I am at CW Weir. Cool. All righty. Yeah. And then you can also, if That's you want to, you can name. follow us here on our fancy Twitch page and see us because we, we have shows up every Tuesday and Thursday. Tuesday's true. more like this. We hang out with professionals in different aspects of the game industry and learn how to do anything from like, we're about to start talking about how to make characters based on RPGs and like how to kind of explore storytelling in that sense. Mm -hmm. um, but we also have done things with like, 
how to make a dragon fly in Maya. <laughs> so like we go we go all over the spectrum on this show. You can literally go back through our archives and watch them and learn how to make your own game, basically yeah. from scratch. Yeah, absolutely. And then uh, Thursdays we just hang out and play video games. It was pretty cool. Yeah. Let's talk a little bit about uh, for our our viewers how to um, how you guys go about creating characters within the like an RPG. Well, it's interesting, like Tyler, because not only did we do it in Dragon Age, but we've done a couple of our comic books have been characters we have swiped from our role playing games. Um, so you know, we yeah, always we feel like a, we did a graphic novel called The Tomb, where the lead character was her character. We we because we played a because I'm I'm a big enough nerd that I'll create my own game system. I mean, that's so like, like are you so we did like a Gerbs? Stargate Stargate role playing game. I just took the uh, hero system. First, I took the White Wolf system and created a Stargate role system for huh. it. Then I did the hero system and created a Stargate, and we just shifted the whole game over to the huh. hero system halfway through the yeah. campaign. And so, her character from yes. that Stargate game wound up being the lead in our graphic novel, The Tomb. So uh, you know, so we've we've taken characters from our role playing games and put them into our writing all the time. It doesn't really work to create a character for a role-playing game with the intention of writing them into something you write. Because you never know how long a campaign's gonna last, whether you get tired of that character, whether that character evolves into something later, that might be better for the story than what you started with. So if you if you start, you gotta just sort of, when you, when you play a role-playing game, you're living the character. Yeah, and then yeah. what that does is it allows you to see story from a character's point of view. Because as writers, one thing we will never be is actors. <laughs> we're not, like we're not good at it. It's not. It's uh, like I'm. I tried it in in college, um, but it wasn't for me. Um, so, but an actor brings a perspective to a character that a writer never can, because you're focused on story, and so all the characters have to do what they're going to do within the story. And so sometimes you feel like you're moving them against their will, and an actor always knows how to make those choices the character's choices. Yeah. To understand the character. And so when you're gaming, you're an actor. And so you're viewing character from an actor's point of view. And I think it informs your writing very differently to then take that character and put them in a story. Because you now, unlike most writers, now have at least a fraction of an actor's perspective on your character. And that, that I think, matters. Oh, it does, definitely. Have you ever, have you ever used... Um, are like role playing like RPGs uh, to work through writer's block or work through an issue if you get stuck on something that you have and you're like oh I'm trying to get from A to A to C but I can't find B. I don't know specifically like it's it's a great diversion like I don't know if we've been able to take our own writing and put it into a game per se but it's a good way just to sort of be in a different character's head and, and mm -hmm. think about a different problem for a while yeah. that might lead you back. Yeah, I think I think it's a very good way to stay creative. While, because the sometimes the thing about writer's block is it's just the frustration of banging your head against the same wall over and over again. And then if you step away and come back at it with a different perspective, you'll no longer be banging your head so you can get through that wall. Um, and I think, but when you step away and you're not creative, when you're not creative and you're a writer, it hurts. It's, a, it's it kind of like a physical it's addiction. Same for acting as yeah. well, yeah. Um, so when you, you're a gamer, when you're not writing, you're gaming, so you're writing anyway. And so it, it satisfies that. It keeps you creative. It keeps you thinking of characters and ideas. It's rarely a good tool. Like, like if, if we were having trouble in a script and I, as a game master, put that trouble into our game, all it would do is make her game more frustrating because she's also <laughs> had some experience in that writer's block. But also, the other players may not have the same approach to that problem that you have. So it's much better, I think, as she said, to sort of just sidestep what's bothering you and just be creative for a while. Do you guys often find that you hit your like waves of like I'm super creative? Oh my god, I can't write anything. Like, are you guys like are you guys are your cycles synced? <laughs> like, actually, I think we are stronger that our cycles are not synced. It's, yeah, because the, when I can't write, she usually can. Oh, that's amazing. And I can step yeah. away, and when she can't write, I usually can. So, if we're super if we're super synced a as a writing team. Will be incredibly productive for a while, and then incredibly unproductive for a while. Um, well, it sounds like you guys are synced, but in like <laughs> a different way. Yeah. Sense. yeah, that's amazing. That's good, and it, I know. I, I think it's good that you guys pull characters from your your games and stuff like that. You guys had a little 
a little bit of a sheepish quality, like, yeah, we pull from our names. It's like, no, no, be proud of that, because that's good. Well, that's how you create that, yeah. characters. And, and that's, characters... What I was, that's what I was saying. Like, how cool would it be to play with a DM who literally writes fantasy and comics for a living? Like, the amount of creativity... I mean, my DM's dope. Like, he's yeah. awesome. But, like, I, I can't even imagine. It must be so much fun to just... Cause well, it's interesting for the two of us. I think it suits our strengths well because in our writing, he is definitely like the plot structure guy, and I am the character person who wants to dig into the little moments and the dialogue and stuff. Yes. And I feel that in like the gaming, sort of like I don't know sometimes how you come up with the bigger world picture where I'm like, but I'm in my little corner doing my thing over here, and the, you know, this works well. I get very obsessive about it. we just started playing zombie side i don't know if you oh that look game. at me not ever playing with you guys ever shut up Sean. <laughs> and so the first thing we do after we play zombie side is i go and i look and i see oh look at all of these extra characters that you i could have gotten if i'd been in on the kickstarter <laughs> what is wrong with me why did i not know about this game so then i found like the little character cards and i went oh they somebody made a customizable one mm. i'll just create characters and we'll use our She's hero made like 20 so I, no, so that's about <laughs> seven um <laughs> 27. <laughs> all right. Westward. So, all right. So how do we come up with wind dancers? Fun, strangely enough, gaming. And not, <laughs> not just that, the Stargate game. There was a character on one of the other SG teams who was named Sofia Mantega, who was a free spirit. And then that game sort of started dying out. And we started looking for places to put those characters because we loved them so much. We created the tomb, but then we were also creating... Uh, New Mutants, I think, a little bit before that. Mm -hmm. And we thought, what if she were a teenager? And then thought, what would be a power for that personality? And that's how we created all of the kids for the X-Men, is we went to teenage archetypes personality-wise and then hit them with the power that would either most accent that personality mm -hmm. or make life for that personality as hard as possible. Mm -hmm. So Wallflower, the super shy girl had pheromone powers that would control people's emotions. Hmm. Um, and so she wouldn't talk to anyone because she would never know whether or not them liking them came from Oh, her my God. Oh. Um, <laughs> wow. And so with and, and with Sophia, Wind Dancer, it was she would go and do what the winds told her at any given time. And the world doesn't tend to respond well to people like that. Yeah. I was just kind say, of go be... with the flow all the time. The world doesn't really... Re and so that was... We just thought, okay... If you not only had that personality, but actually the wind. And the first power we thought of for that was not wind manipulation in the classic, I'm going to blow people in a combat way, but in this notion of what would happen if you were on the other side of the school and the wind brought you the words of the kids who were talking about you. Right. It seems like a mean power. I feel <laughs> it's, it's interesting because I feel like you guys really... And I haven't read them yet because I'm going to steal them from you. But... Um, from what you guys are describing, it seems like you, more than in the past, you, you know, past writers for the Marvel series, you guys are, you delve in almost to like, what, like when Wind Dancer grows up to be this type of person, or like, you know, when, when Jean Grey was, was, was a teenager and she was dealing with these emerging powers and, and that shame and all of that stuff that ended up bringing about the, the culmination of the Phoenix. Mm -hmm. um, like you guys are, are really kind of going into the humanity of it. Like it, it seems like well, you're really bringing a human aspect to these, these superheroes, these mutants. We were, we were given the really fun task of they said, we want a book that focuses on Xavier's Institute. Uh, at the time, this little data, but they said, we want Dawson's Creek. We basically want yeah. Dawson's Creek at Xavier's Institute. And they said, you know, and we've got the existing X-Men who teach their come and go, but you guys have free reign. You can create students, which was like, this is cool. We just get to go create new mutants. And, um, and because yeah. it wasn't a superhero book, it was a teen drama oh, book no. with superpowers. Yeah. We had to go at it yeah. from that character yeah. point of view. And I think in a lot of ways, it has shaped how we write other books mm. because now we always come at it and I think because we borrowed Sophia from from the Stargate game because we took from a, a, a Champions which is a superhero game mm. we took certain concepts and powers and personalities from characters from that game and filled out the 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 Xavier's Institute with that it became the approach that we then took to everything which is take from our gaming which is always character based and so so feel free to not answer this <laughs> but how how old were you guys when you wrote those teenage characters? 
a lot older than teenagers. <laughs> <laughs> Is it like 30, 32, yeah. I think? Something like that. Because, because it's just fascinating to me because like when you guys are talking about kind of the struggles that they were dealing with, and I mean, I don't know, I'm sure for you as well, like... I remember getting bullied as a kid, or like I, rem- oh, we're going I into remember. Those stories. No, 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 I just I remembered. I remembered those those emotions of like when you do accidentally overhear someone saying something that you weren't supposed to hear. Like it's devastating, you know. And I just it was. Well, it's and, interesting. And, and, and we I wield a character about- who is built around the persona of I don't care about that, but of course you do. Yeah. Like if you hear the words from somebody who doesn't think you're listening, of course you care. Right. And you can say you're a free spirit, but... Do you have any tips for people that are just starting to get into comic book writing or people that um, that are interested in, in, in writing for for this genre in general? I mean, the first thing, like, to write comic books, you need to read them. Is really the simplest thing because it is a different language. There is a different sort of pacing and a structure and that sense of how much story can fit on a page. And so I would just say, like, read comic books like yeah all types because they're it's a separate language yeah. in a sense and if you're just familiar with the language you can write in it um because there's no specific format you can make your way in comics any way you want um but i would read comics and then i would look at um books that show comic scripts brian bendis has a, has published a few books that has have his scripts in the back greg ruck has published a few books that have his scripts in the back and what happens when you enter the comics field is that the people who are working in the field send you their scripts. Um, so Bendis gave Greg his scripts, and Greg modified it based on his interaction with editors and what those editors particularly were looking for. Then Greg gave it to us when we went in, and then we modified it based on what we were encountering with editors. And then we give that to all of our students because we have a comic class at, at NYFA on writing comics. New York Film Academy. Yes. <laughs> In case anybody doesn't know what we're saying. We're not like knife her. We're like, no, the New York Film Academy yes. knife us. No, we do not knife people in our comic class. No. That would be bad. But you draw in the comics. You could draw someone being knifed in a comic. Yeah. Comic. But, but anyway, we, we pass that format on to them, and then we tell them, you're going to encounter changes that you need to make to the format that fit better for the way you write, fit better for the, what your editor is looking for, fit better for what the artists you're working with are looking for. So, um, that's awesome. So, what about when it comes to uh, writing within the different types of comics and graphic novels? Because you guys have also written original manga. Yes, um, the original manga we wrote in in film screenplay format, um, just because the artist that was working with the publisher wanted to see what would happen if the artist had complete control over the pacing of the pages. And early on, I think the the pacing was a little bit slower than we would have liked. And so we started sending notes like, this should move a little bit faster. Um, but she's so amazing that by the time we were done, it was completely in sync. Like we would, we would write the screenplay and, and picture in our head, it would be about this many pages. And then she'd turn in the artwork and it would be almost exactly that many wow. pages. Um, we, and we wouldn't say to her, do that. Yeah. Just She got a sense of our rhythm and we got a sense of her rhythm while writing it so we could anticipate. Um, that's pretty, that's pretty so <laughs> the different forms, I think when you go beyond uh, that, you know, beyond that sort of what's a screenplay versus what's in comic format, I think that then it gets to just writing for page breaks and chapter breaks. Yeah. Like writing an issue of a Marvel or DC book uh, has, they have an issue break that has to bring people back and it's a lot worse than writing TV where the commercial break has to bring people back three minutes later. You have to bring someone back 30 days later. Wow. And so you That's have so to good. really, and there are people like Brian K. Vaughn who are so good at, like, way better than we are, at creating cliffhangers at the end that he can easily resolve at the beginning of the next issue so he can get back to the story he was telling, but he's he's got you hooked. You're coming back. Um, and that's the trick. And if you do that in a fake way, every time you do a cliffhanger, the reader's like, yeah, I know this will be resolved in two pages, so I don't care. And they'll stop. He's playing. hanging off a cliff. What will he do next episode? He pulls out his favorite breakfast spoon and climbs up. Yeah, exactly. And yeah, exactly. So. Um, okay, so I guess, let's see. What do we also, I guess we can talk a little bit about, um, I think we have like about 10 minutes? Hmm. Five minutes. Uh, oh my gosh, if we have five minutes, I've got to tell you guys, you rock for coming in. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. It's true. Um, it's been a lot what, of fun. What all, what all, what is your like, Okay. Number one, what is your like number one thing that you're looking forward to working on? Like, what's your number one project that you're like the thing that I'm, in the horizon? The thing that I'm most excited about um, is is right now. 
I have such a deep love for Dragon Age that, and then the art has come in so spectacular. I am really excited for people to see this book. Beyond that, I think um, there's stuff that she's working on without me, which <gasps> is strange and totally okay with me. <laughs> um, and that she cannot talk about right now yes. because it's not a done deal and we've, right. we've learned the hard way that if you start, like, yeah. they're, like we would say things to DC Comics fans like, yeah, we're working on one of our favorite characters and they would go like, it's Booster Gold. Because he's talked about how much he loves Booster Gold. <laughs> so there were fans who knew that Booster Gold yeah. thing was in the works, even though we tried desperately not to talk about it, so that when it went away, we had to be like, Rachel, no, sorry, not working on Booster Gold. So we're wow. not going to go anywhere near this, but cool. I think it's the kind of thing that with every minute that she's been working on, she's gone crazy about. Yeah, no, it's, 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 it's exciting. <laughs> it's a good caught. crazy back. <laughs> <laughs> no, de definitely good crazy, yeah. I, it, It's another like tie into a franchise sort of thing where I didn't know the franchise previously, and now like diving into this, been like, oh, oh, I see why people are talking about this. This is fun. And then so our miniseries, right? Bad Medicine, is in development as a potential TV series. But oh, awesome. Honestly, I couldn't tell you the likelihood of it becoming a TV series because right. that's the nature of the industry. Yeah. Um, if that were to happen, I would be ridiculously excited. Would be really I, excited. Even if we weren't involved, even if they just made it, I would just love to watch it yeah. and, and collect my check. But yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so it was a little plus. Yeah, so, so going back, uh, we have a couple more minutes left. Um, going back to what you said, you said that the artwork for Night Errant is just spectacular. Yeah, you saw right? that the page. Yeah, that absolutely. Came out. So, how often in video game design, a lot of the time they'll have, like, because I do motion capture, mm -hmm. I'm a motion capture actor, mm -hmm. and a lot of the time I will get a picture of the character, or, you know, you'll get an idea, and then you figure out why do they move this way? How mm -hmm. do they move? What mm -hmm. do they sound like? What do they, you know, everything about them as far as their physicality. How often do you guys get, like, oh, you know, you, we need you to have this character, this is what this variant of that character looks like, and then you write for, I guess this is more for you, because you're, you're more in charge of character stuff, <laughs> you're saying. So, like, how often do you know what your character variant is going to look like before you really write for it? We don't always know before, so, like, a lot of times we'll have story going first, and then we'll start to see designs come in. Um, but we will usually it, see it, character design work before... I feel Before like, I don't know if you felt this, but our book, uh, Amazing Agent Luna, that we did, that we did 11 volumes of, I think. Wow. We were with that book for over 10 years. So I really wow. like those are characters that lived in us. And I felt like one of the characters, Ollie, really evolved the more we saw his art, the way Shie was drawing him. Like, mm -hmm. I felt like even though we had that character concept for him, the when the the designs and everything kept coming back, like yeah. we kept writing more and more. He was just so adorable. Yeah, there are times... And, and and similarly, when we were on New X-Men, there were characters in the background in the school yeah. scenes that we had nothing to do with creating um, that uh, specific car specific artists, uh, Michael Ryan and, and yeah. specifically, um, did a lot of, it's the cafeteria, and look, here's a kid whose head looks like a big match. Or actually, I think Carlo Barbier <laughs> Barbieri created the kid whose head looked like a big match, but then Michael Ryan retooled him. And we sort of looked at those and went, Oh, we like that design and that design and that design. And then we'd reach out to the artist and say, what were you thinking? And in, in one case, Michael Ryan was like, well, this, this, this character is designed after my little sister. Hmm. And so we were like, okay, she's going on a squad. And we gave her a name and powers and all of that. And she did not get blown up on a bus. <laughs> she, yeah. she survived. So um, we have a few minutes left. Is there anything else you guys want to talk about? Any Anything else, any cool projects that you want to plug? Just a quick follow-up question to what we were just talking about. So when, uh, when you're writing for a character and all that, uh, if there is no illustration, if there is no design, do you at least have a breakdown? Like, this person has a metal arm and a sky arm. Yeah, no, what we'll do yeah. is we'll... At the mm. proposal stage of a miniseries, we'll list out the characters, and then what we'll do is once we know that the, the book is going forward, we'll take those character bios, we'll put them in a new document, and we'll add new paragraphs underneath about our thoughts about what they might look like. Then the artwork comes in, um, and the editor and the writers and everybody involved mm. will sort of go, oh, I don't know about that. And so in the case of uh, Knight Errant, it was the Dark Horse, our editors of Dark Horse, the two of us, and the Bioware guys in particular, because it's got to fit the game aesthetic. So their art team took a look at the character designs and said, no, let's 
tweak it this way. And then we saw all of that conversation. Had a chance to jump in, but their notes were so good, we were just like, you guys got this. That's awesome. Cool. So. Very cool. Awesome. Well, that answers my question. <laughs> Anything Anyways, else about things that we want to yeah, we want to plug. The thing that's coming out right now uh, is is Night Aaron, and that's what that's I. That's May tenth is when and, the first issue. And everyone drops. should check it out because it's a beautiful book. It really is. Yeah, it's the so artwork gorgeous. was amazing. And this was, was book, there are yeah. cases when you write where everything is, as you write it, you go, this is what I wanted it to be, and that's a really good feeling. And then there are other cases that, in the act of writing, you go, oh, I didn't expect to be moved in the way that I am moved. By this scene, or be to to be amused in the way that I am amused. It's rare once you've done a lot of writing, like we have. It's rare to amuse yourself. It's rare to move yourself. And there were a couple of moments when writing this where we were like, "Wow, that that I didn't expect to get as deep with these characters as we've gotten." So That's amazing. So I'm very excited about it on that level. Cool. And then we get to create characters who are a piece of the Dragon Age lore. That's yeah. a big deal. Yeah. Absolutely. <laughs> well, thank you guys so much for coming into the studio tonight. This was, I had a blast. Oh, yeah. Shit.